Welcome to the Cognitive Rampage Podcast. I'm your host, Adam Lowry. I hope you're taking care of you. I hope you're living your Cognitive Rampage. Like I said before, no more intro music. Um, just feeding you direct competence and, and getting to the point of why we're doing this. And um, our guest today is Michael Wood Jr. He's a retired U.S. Marine, retired Baltimore Sergeant, and now I would probably define him as a staunch activist for police reform, gun reform, and especially standing up for the disadvantaged youth. That is something where it hits hard in my heart. Um, as some of you know about myself, I have a, a rough upbringing in the places I've been around. Uh, so when I first heard Michael talking like he was years ago, um, very uh, directly, uh, almost with no PC, which is what I loved, it was great to hear a uniformed officer talking the truths about what's really happening in communities around the country and uh, the problems that stem from so many biases uh, and so many broken systems that are in place. And this is going to touch on some nerves for some of you. This is going to hit some soft places and some hard places. And I only urge you that if you find yourself reacting to anything Michael and I say here with this concrete belief of what is, that's usually a good place to start by questioning self. So if you find yourself angrily responding out loud in your car as you're listening to this, I'd like you to stop and go, well, why do I believe what I believe so staunchly? Why am I forcing this? And open yourself up to new ideas because what Michael brings to the table is truly that. He brings new ideas because we have to start somewhere. We can't keep putting Band-Aids over a broken system that's killing people and destroying lives. And Michael has seen it. He's been in the trenches of that. Uh, even from the military down to uh, Baltimore streets, where we all know is very active in the media, et cetera, and what's going on. So uh, I want to dive right into that. So uh, first off, uh, Michael, thank you for doing the show, and uh, welcome on the Cognitive Rampage, man. Uh, thanks a lot for having me, brother. I appreciate the discussion, just as you're saying. That's all it is, is getting the ideas out there and hashing out the details and nuances. It is, and trying to get some of those out. I want to dive right in and be in my background is more in counseling and psychology. Before I like to jump into policies or tips or things like that, I like to try to get to know the person a little bit, you know, the background, where they come from. So, uh, you know, I'd start out by asking you, you know, what would you say are the most distinct differences between the environment that you were raised in as a child and came up in in teen years versus the environments that you patrolled in Baltimore? Well, yeah, I mean... I was actually a little bit lower on the factor scale. So I lived in government subsidized housing and Edgewood, uh, Java Town area on the suburbs of Baltimore. That is like, a, um, it's kind of where they push people out of the city too. And so we didn't have this kind of racial thing. We were a mixed community. We were just all poor. And, uh, you know, the things that come along with that. But my first exchange that I can remember is we were playing basketball once and somebody called the police and everybody else ran but me and one of my friends we didn't run we were like whatever you know we're playing basketball eat it so we both got taken into custody and being put into in there well for playing basketball because it was they had chained it off the community said that the you know it was closed for the weekend or whatever they just do those things arbitrarily that's, that's the way it works like closing pools and things like that. So, but when that when the sheriff's deputy came, uh, my friend who was black got put in handcuffs and I didn't. And we were in the back of the car and he was, you know, saying like, hey, like seriously, why am I in handcuffs? And he's not, this is because it's a, a black, isn't it? And I'm like, no, dude, shut up because he's just gonna put me in handcuffs. Like, why are you throwing me under the bus right now? We're supposed to be friends, shut up. But, you know, later on, you realize it's like, you know what? And like the bad kid between me and him was me, not him. He's he's the saint, but he was the one being treated that way. And I was the one that that was given preferential treatment for no apparent reason. So you had those kind of things that were still persistent. But that's a big dr dramatic difference still from what it's like being in East or West Baltimore, where the entire system is against you and those cops are coming out to get you. We, while, while, you know, we may have been picked up for that once, that was once when we were on the corners, we were playing basketball late at night, we were causing noises, we were playing in the streets, we were doing all those kind of things that kids in the city 
would do and then end up getting jacked up for and searched. And if we would have gotten jacked up and searched, well, they would have found the same things on us that they find in anybody in East or West Baltimore. So we didn't have that being, you know, pushed into the system aspect is really the big dividing line. So you recognize then early a racial divide, a very plain racial and even socioeconomic divide as, as a young kid. Well, I mean, even though I was in mixed area, it was still, um, you had that rural America attitude where the common tripe was like that keep those, those monkeys in the city and uh, you know keep the problems down there and out, out into the county and like that black guys were you know faster because they had an extra leg muscle in their calf or something like all those kind of old wives tales and tropes they still were were very persistent in those communities so that that's like what you heard constantly i mean you still hear that now yeah i can relate man i'm i was born in a uh very small what used to not be so disadvantaged city called pine hills that they refer to as crime hills now uh, and then I was raised in the, like you, on the edge of the suburbs, if you will, of a place called Okoy. And out there, it was very much that white country redneck, or you were this uh, hoodlum, if you will. You know, and I, and I found myself kind of in the middle of that, that cusp and very early was apparent to the, the influence of racial bias amongst, you know, officers in the community. And, you know, I, I want to lead into a little farther. I under, I definitely understand. I, I remember you saying on a few interviews that you always knew that you wanted to be a cop, you know, from being from being a child. And was it that story or is there another story that may have caused or confirmed that idea that you always wanted to be an officer? Yeah. You know, when you have memories that are that old, you, like, you really, is it even my memory or is that like something my mother has told me throughout time and is is self-fulfilling and, and that's what actually happened. I, I don't really know. I mean, I remember watching cops and getting excited about that and playing the video games and you know thinking that it would be a cool thing to do and, and having you know, a general public service empathy kind of mindset to do something that's also contributes, but you know, I certainly would have been more on the adrenaline thrill side than the contribute side. I was like, the, the benefit was that you were helping the community. And that's kind of my mentality that persisted uh, throughout. Yeah, so that kind of protector feel and, I mean, being an athlete and going right in, that, that definitely we've talked a, a few times about how that seems to be a natural transition uh, from what you do. Now, is there a reason that you went into the military prior to becoming a cop? Well, I, I mean, I knew I didn't have enough discipline to, like, go to college. I wasn't ready for that uh, I, I knew myself enough and at least know that so i wanted to have something more structured and so if i was going to go into the military well if you're going to do it you go into the marine corps and you do it so that was kind of the mindset there i went with two friends from high school uh one that became a cop and uh, one that became an accountant uh the one that became an accountant was the one that was arrested with me uh, so Two cops, so one accountant, and the accountant was the one that was in handcuffs. But you know, so hey, that kind of speaks today's laws too, right? <laughs> I think we should be putting more accountants. In more than... So I don't even remember where I was going with that. So oh, that's why I went in, and and now it was like a pathway, you know. So it's that pathway for the poor to get to, to middle class. So um, now that feels pretty dirty because what I, I went in when I was I signed the contract when I was sixteen. Oh, and went in when I was 17. So uh, that had been like the uh, oppressors, you know, kind of like using the poorness to create a 17 year old who you put, uh, I mean, I was trained to go through a weapon to through close quarters battles, raiding houses and rescuing hostages before I was e ever able to even vote. So it was like, that, that kind of really feels dirty now. And I was in DC recently and looking at the war memorials and I was like, ah, I don't know, man, like this, this, this feels pretty gross now. And that mentality of like using that government line and that service or whatever to continue to advance, uh, it became that logical pathway because the only skill set that I really had was, was killing. So that went right to the police department, which is the only, avenue you have for that unless you want it to go like the cia actively recruited us but i didn't want to travel anymore uh, i didn't want to go like do some uh, you know 
private contractor thing and go to Iraq or some bullshit like that. So, you know, the only way to stay home really is the police department. It's the only way my skills transfer. And uh, went into that just as a natural thing and doing the drug work and chasing it around. But yeah, you just, I don't know if, if once you start thinking about what you're doing, it's, it's a snowball effect of, of coming to the conclusion that you're, you're more of a part of the problem than you are the solution. Mm. And so many people are are not willing to look at that. And, you know, with my background, man, I can only imagine, you know, a, a guy from the middle suburbs who, you know, signs up to try to better his life because he's aware of some things and makes a choice, you know, that we do seem that it is the path of the poor to the middle class. It's very Rome gladiator ish still. And for a 17 and 18 year old to take that type of, you know, hypersensitivity training, I mean, that that's had to put you in, in a hyper state of vigilance, you know, for, for most of that young adulthood. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I kind of actively resist that now where, um, I, I try to make sure I don't go armed anywhere. I try to you know, sit with my back to the door at a restaurant because I'm like, God, to act with some common sense, nothing is going to happen here. And if it does, you know, so be it, but I'm not going to live my life in a paranoid state of fear. So, you know, that, that is what it is. I was constantly like, I didn't know people's faces because I would never look at faces. I watched hands and hips and, and, and how a person moves because that's what I was on guard for. And that constant state of alertness that they, they do actively continue to train you that anybody with firearms has to be in this constant state of yellow, of being hyper vigilant. Yeah. The, the fight, the, the fact that you, you know, put that out there. I know a lot of people that listen to this show are uh, veterans. My, my friend, Ali, uh, love you, buddy. Alistair is, was over there as a Marine Corps to experience some very traumatic things. And I've done a lot of work with veterans before that talk just like you do, you know, that come back and they're trying to find a way to reconnect with you, with the humanity, because you're, you're almost program like trained in a way. And I, I wonder how much of an effect really does that you know, robot Manchurian training, you know, affect how police departments act or how police are, are in the field. Is, is, the sim, is the training very similar like that? Well, what you got to think is you, you've heard this, this common saying of police. We don't make the laws. We just enforce them. And that capitalizes the entire mentality is they apply no level of morality to what they're doing. It is simply following the orders. And it's like, you're calling that patriotic, but it's like that is the exact opposite. You are appealing to authority. You are following the master, and you think that, like, I'm the unpatriotic one because I'm standing up and saying no and fighting for the people. It's like that, it's a, a really deep level of cognitive dissonance that comes in. Maybe it's even like Stockholm syndrome ish, where you're just sympathizing with the oppressor because cops are treated like shit. From, from command and from uh, you know politicians so they get they do get the brunt you know they get citizen criticism and they get a department that's not supporting them so they end up having that thing too where they feel oppressed so it's logical that you can fall into that mentality yeah and especially if uh, i heard you mention that some of the best you know the ideal cop that they're looking for is you know the guy that's in the marines that's in shape that is focus that follows orders that that does this and i and i keep coming back to that manchurian candidate response and i i wonder i mean th this is to take the feel out of it right to take the humanity out of what you're really doing well of course but i don't think that they're ever doing that on purpose like i don't think there's a master plan it's that you have these narratives so you just fit all your puzzles in to fit fit the narrative that you're already like trying to achieve. So it's just that self-fulfilling prophecy when, when you're just putting those things in place. Uh, I mean, like you hear constantly now cops saying about how dangerous their job is when their job is super not dangerous at all. It, it's, it's the safest year in, in the history of civilization. The, the safest place to be a cop was last year in America in the history of the entire world. And we are acting like it's some dangerous thing when it's it has a high uh, potential for danger, but it, it it's just simply so, so not a dangerous job. job. 
so does driving your car, right? right. I mean, well, the, the car remains much more dangerous. The, the, most, the most dangerous thing that cops do is drive the car all day long. Just like a taxi cab driver, the most dangerous thing he does is drive that car all day long. So you would cut fatalities of police officers by like two thirds if you just made them walk. Wow. Like a look, I'm definitely have some questions that get into some some changing of the guard there, if you will. And uh, but I, I, I'm really interested in staying kind of stuck on this this police training. Right. And I've had some experiences in my uh, younger adulthood that now as a you know trained mental health professional, I look back and I see such a lack of training in that area. And is there, could you maybe briefly cover what your training was like in the academy? And if there was any focus on, say, the psychological involvement with other people or dealing with mental disorders, you know, et cetera, even is there specialty classes on like driving at high rates of speed and firearm training, et cetera? Oh, uh, so each one is different. But so in Maryland, you have a statewide agency that certifies everyone. And so you have these standards that are kind of the uniform. Across the entire state and so things like psych psychology I mean they're not I don't remember that ever being addressed really at all maybe wow. in passing of some sort what um, de-escalation the average is, is eight hours I don't I don't think there's anything different from that um that kills me I mean just to be a mental health tech in a hospital you got to do that twice a year right so I mean this is why they can't do their job and why they're not supported. So the officer, from his or her perspective, is being to expected to do something they have no capability of doing, and, and no one's teaching them how to do it, and they don't know, they, it's just not, the teaching isn't there. You, the general idea is that you take somebody with a GED or above, and you just give them six months of this, I mean, it's not like intense training, it's, it's, it's like a, I mean, think about what, what can you achieve in six to eight months? It's, it's a, a kickoff, you know, yeah. It, yeah. that's your starting point of, of things. You, and then you would have to progress further from that point. Firearms training is, is woefully inadequate. Everything is woefully inadequate. The only reason uh, that anybody has any true skill set in policing is because they went and did it on their own. The military taught me how to fire. The military taught me discipline. College taught me how to write. I, I went to a bunch of other schools and learned how to do my job professionally. Uh, it, that's all things I did on my own. No, There's no way to do that within the structure. I, I can't imagine not even one psychology course to even talk about being able to recognize a mental disorder. I mean, being able to walk up knowing that you're talking to someone that is schizophrenic or the possible ideas of, uh, you know, a fit rage or, I mean, it blows me away, Mike, that there is no psychological training at all, except maybe a, a few de-escalation tactics. Yeah, they try this thing called, um, I don't remember what it's called. It had some BEST, behavioral something, I forget what it stood for. And those, they sent a few officers to like this specialized training for those kind of things. But they do that stuff in like a one-off. So then by time, and then they use selective officers. So they, they use their buddies who end up in admin positions. And they're not really the guys that are on the streets anyway, because the guys on the streets, they don't want to spend six months going to some class uh, because they're going to miss out uh, on what the system incentivizes them to do. So the system doesn't incentivize you and reward you for going to the class or reward you for locking people up. And then you get the jobs that you want. And and you get your career opportunities and things like that. That's just the way the system works. I mean, we really, we actually know this. The only difference is that I'm just confirming it. My gosh. So, uh, so I'm safe to assume, though, that when a cop speeds by me at 90 and a 35 with his lights going, that he's at least driven around a test track or something once or twice, right? <laughs> yes. Um, so in Maryland, there's a really nice course that, that does that with the vehicles. But the ultimate problem there is that we're actually encouraging something that's dangerous. We, we actually shouldn't know how to drive the car very well, because if we need to have those skills, we should, that should be where we stop. Mm, yeah, I like that. I mean, sometimes I do watch and I'm going, now this guy just put about 30 cars in danger with that little stunt through the intersection. And I'm going, now, 
this better be serious. I mean, how many times really are there coming in lights at 100 miles an hour and 80? Is it really, you know, something? What Are there certain protocols which calls for that? I mean, is, is a theft of a pack of bubble gum, you know, a, a 90 mile an hour, you know, go to? Well, sure. I mean, all those things are defined in policy in, in a logical and rational fashion. It's what's actually done on the street and what is supervised and enforced. You get what you inspect, not what you expect. So they expect that people will follow these things, but there's no follow-up supervision. So you get what you, you don't inspect. Well, that leads, that's funny you say policy, because the literal next question was, does policy trump reason? And are the group norms the real rules? You know, And how much does policy really matter on the street? Yeah, the policies actually are, are fairly sufficient. Um, some of they're, they're a little too complex at this point, and they're a little too wordy. They have contradictions in them. But if you were to pick up the policy of any police department, you would clearly get the impression that the number one priority was to protect life and that all things were to be done to protect a suspect when he, was in your, he or she was in your custody. You would get all the correct type of ideas that you have in your head. It's what goes on that, that is completely different. And um, the, part of those reasons are that the complexity of the job isn't achievable in the time frames and stuff that management allows you. So the, an officer can't really properly handle a rape call because the supervisors in the system don't give them the time to, to do that. So everything is rushed and everything is get back on the street as fast as possible. So the only way to achieve what your bosses are forcing you to do is to shortcut the general orders uh, one of the things I, st I would always tell people in, in the police department is like, if we want to stand up, the way to stand up is to just follow the rules and do the job properly and force them to support us and give us what we need. But everybody would just go by the shortcut and, and, and just give the bosses what they need. Well, because then you're only cutting from the civil rights of the citizens. You're not really cutting your life. I mean, that speaks to the power and psychology, the idea of group think, you know, and how at that entire group, I mean, I put a video up a little while ago from uh, Anonymous about the monkey training that they did where they pulled certain monkeys out of the cage and they would wet the monkeys to begin with that if one went up to the, to get a banana on top of a ladder, they'd wet them all. And by the end, they had all brand new monkeys that had never been wet with water, but they were still beating the shit out of each other. And that group think, I can see how when you walk into that, maybe a, uh, hypervigilant or even insecure, you know, person into a group of full of testosterone, full of brotherhood, right? And these social norms that have gone on for decades. And then you're given these policies that are well written, that sound great. And but that's just not what we do. We beat up the monkey that goes for the banana. Yeah, I, I mean, so this is uh, the article that I was alluding to right before we came on the air that the Baltimore Sun just published that I sent in is talking about precisely this, that there was this big news conference where the police commissioner came out and was like, we got this new use of force policy after Freddie Gray and the lessons that we learned from that. And these are all the things that were changing. And it's like, bullshit. All those things were in policy before. So I sat there and wrote that all this stuff was already in place. It's been in place as early as 1997. And, and none of these things are just followed and supervised, which is an indictment on your management and your command staff. It's not an indictment on these officers because the officers don't know. It's your damn everybody that's in charge and they just blame down. So remember, whenever you're blaming that officer on the street, it's that same thing. You're covering for the oligarchy by blaming the, the person that's subject to the oppression just as in, in a fashion similar to everybody else. Man, I mean, I, you know, I've said that the movie V for Vendetta speaks to that, to that idea that if, you know, the cops that are standing on the barricades at, at very, you know, subtle, low key protests, you know, I mean, the cops, what are they making 38 to 42 thousand dollars a year to to take chances, to be ridiculed by society on, on bad choices to, you know, they, they are in some quite, you know, strange predicaments that that call for, you know, moral judgment sometimes. And you're right. I mean, they seem to also face the ideas of social constructs and repression on their side, forced down to them, like you said. I mean, I pissed off command by doing this. One of the sayings I had was that respect is something that is earned. Uh, rank is something that is given. So if you find yourself reminding people of your rank, then you obviously don't have respect. 
Mm. And, and so what I would do actively is I wouldn't have people call me by my rank and wouldn't have people salute me. And higher ups wouldn't like that I would do that. And I would let them call me Mike. And the idea to me, I, I made it clear. I said, look, if you don't respect me for being Mike Wood, then all of this is for nothing. Because I need you to follow me when the shit hits the fan. And you're not going to follow me because what's on my shoulder. You're going to follow me because of who I am. So all of you people that think you're leading and you're leaning on your rank, you're not leading shit. And, and that was that like that bucked the system. And like they hated me for that kind of stuff. And it's like, this is completely rational. You guys get this, right? Like what I'm saying is completely rational. But it was just that it would buck the system. So it was like, what are you doing? Yeah, when you question the norms of the things that they've earned, like they feel, or the old guard, the processes like that, well, it for me, it would show that the brass there had not had psychology courses. That sounds like something maybe you pulled from the military. I have no idea. I mean, I, I have done this uh, semi-obsession, if somebody wants to see my LinkedIn profile or something, where life um, seems to be about checking boxes. And so I have done every educational opportunity I have possibly had just to like get rid of that no true Scotsman thing because somebody's going to say, you never led this. You never, you would know if you had kids. You would know if you've been in this neighborhood. You would know if you had an education. You would know if you served in the military. So I try to check like every single box that I can. So all my, that's why I say all my ideas are really stuff that's just, put together from other people it's i don't think there's any original train thoughts here yeah yeah i was just kind of comparing some of that you know you you know you follow your brother in the marines like you know my buddy ali has talked to me a lot about you know you put your life in their hands many times and if they're following you because they have to it's hard to trust the man behind you yeah totally i mean i mean it's just it's these things that like you said if you picked up and read any real leadership books and, and, and research, you would know these things. But policing is literally an ideology. It borders on a religion because they have things that they know aren't true and they continue to follow it. For example, Comey, the FBI director, I wrote an article about that too, where he was talking about Ferguson effect, which is proven to not only is it an unsubstantiated claim, it is proven false. And he is the FBI director spreading that information to the public. And it's like you and the only place you get that from is the ideology that police have that being proactive leads to crime reduction. And that's not correlated. That has been proven false. So they don't they're they're living in a world that says the earth is round and they're just going, no, it's flat. No, it's flat. No, it's flat. And we're like, fuck, we, we, we literally flew outside and we turned around and we looked. It's a goddamn it's round. OK, just 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 stop. But it's I mean, it's the it's the whole head of the snake that's still saying the lie. Man, and unless you chop the head off, the snake keeps just growing more and growing more. And that's what seems to happen as if, you know, it just perpetuates the same religious ideologies of that thin blue line, almost as if it's to justify their existence or justify their right to do what it is they've been taught to do. Like you said, we we just follow orders, right? I mean, we're just, we just enforce them. We don't, you know, we don't create those orders. Yeah, look at the criticisms of, of me. It's not my point. It's that I'm a heretic. Like, that's how they see me. You don't see any cops stepping up and refuting my, my, my points and refuting what happens. It's all, it's all ad hominem attacks because that's what I am to them. I'm a heretic. You know, they, they, they want their little jihad on me or something. I have no, it's, it's, that's the reaction. It's a religious reaction, not one of, of intellectualism. Wow. I'm to go further to another reaction that's not intellectualism is you and I uh, have spoke about the idea of Black Lives Matter on how a response to this has been Blue Lives Matter in some response. And I think you said you if you could clarify for me, your the simple response should be what if if it wasn't uh, when, when someone makes the statement, you know, Black Lives Matter, that most police officers should just say, I think it was. Yes, they do. Yes, they. Do. I mean, well, I mean, it's not an argument. If you're saying all lives matter, does does that mean that Black lives matter? Yeah, because Black lives fall under all lives. So, like, what are you objecting to? It's like someone's being like, it, it's it's like it's like someone being like, yeah, uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches are, are matter, and and then somebody steps up and is like, no, bitch, 
all sandwiches matter. And it's like, okay, like, yeah, that's cool. But that's like, that still means that the peanut butter and jelly sandwich matters, right? <laughs> yeah, I would agree. I said maybe the branding idea was lost with the idea of Black Lives Matter. But I mean, it wasn't about the brand. It was about getting just an idea of a discrepancy and how things do. You're right. I, it becomes this, oh, yeah, but what am I? You know, this back and forth, how old are we comparison? Right. I mean, do black lives matter? Yeah. Do trans lives matter? Yeah. I mean, but the thing is, is so the parallel that I've seen to to draw is like, OK, so think of it this way. We in baseball is American baseball is not America's sport anymore. OK, it's, we know this. The NFL is right. So one of the reasons why is because you have a capitalistic infrastructure in in baseball that continues to feed the elites, continues to feed the Yankees and the, and the Red Sox and things like that. So what we're talking about here is do the Tampa Bay Devil Rays, right? So if they went to say, hey, we need more money to have a better team. Yeah, they do. But if the Yankees said, hey, we need more money to have a better team. Yeah, you do. But shut the fuck up until the Devil Rays get some, or to the Tampa Bay Light. What are they? The Devil Rays, yeah. And so they get s so, some playing time, right? You can't be the Yankees and bitch about it. And that's what being a white male in America is. You're the goddamn Yankees. Chill out, okay? Like, you got the advantage, and you're going to have it for a long damn time. So just help everybody out a little bit so we can have something like the NFL, where we have revenue sharing, and we give to the weakest of, the mo of us, and we have a true socialism infrastructure in the NFL. And that is why we are all excited because we know that every single year, every single team has a chance to make the sport better and to make all of us more interested, which has grown the sport to be the biggest thing in the world. Nothing, nobody's watching this, anything like they watch the Super Bowl. So, and that has been socialism and it's carried out. You all stand up and root for it and I'll apply it to your own damn lives. Whew. Tell them in that rampage. I mean, it's the same way the, the brass got nervous when you said, don't call me by my rank, call me by my name. And you adjust that when, and so when people that are the old school, I mean, let's look, I'm in the South. Okay. That's where I was raised. That's where I live. It's a different world down here. A lot of people don't understand. And when you're around that kind of stuff, it shakes it up when all of a sudden they're seeing, oh, well, if you can announce black lives matter, right? If there's this pushback as if like, why can't we just be happy or love for that and go, yeah, po you know, point that out that, you know, race does play a role in police decisions. Well, uh, and it's it's just a matter of like looking at anything. I mean, it's it plays out in almost everything that I can think of. And the science is well studied. These things you can just like you can type into Google. Is there a racial bias in resumes? Yes. In hiring? Yes. In sentencing? Yes. In, in, in arrest rates? Yes. In drug use and treatment? Yes. It, you know, it just goes on and on and on. So what, I don't know where, you're, where the denial possibly comes from. Like, I, I recognize my privilege, yes, and I appreciate that I have it. And that doesn't make me a bad person. It would make me a bad person if I didn't try to use that privilege to help somebody else or to continue efforts so that they would have the same amount of privilege. Mm. And that's an utter idea of self-humility, being able to question self. And I, I would ask you, you know, what role does race play within the police force? Not quite in the community and, how the, and on the street and those decisions. We all are starting to grasp some of that. But on the force itself, you know, in ranking and promotions, and is it different amongst the brass? You're going to see the exact same things. That's where I first started fighting it. I first started fighting it from the inside, when I started seeing promotional disparities, I started seeing uh, the treatment of people that were on medical being different. I started seeing uh, discipline was different. There was a big civil suit from like the 80s over promotions in Baltimore Police Department that were racially biased and they had to fix it then, but a lot of it still lingers because they have a good old boy network. And uh, when I recognized the, the information for the testing, that's when I wrote the guide for lieutenants and below that that goes through all the processes on how to be a shift commander in the police department and how to pass the test and what knowledge you need to have and i put it all in one book so that everybody could have it and that bucked the system which obviously sent me down the path again because uh, i made a level playing field on promotions and generally about 50 sergeants are promoted and 25 of the 50 were people that i taught so it totally 
upset their structure uh, and controlling who got promoted. And um, so uh, what what you see is um, black and officers are about 50 percent of the officers. And then they're about like 48 percent of the detectives. And then there are about 45 percent of the sergeants and 40 of the lieutenants. And and then the only time you see it come back up is towards the end in the upper echelons where they make a political appointment trying to act like they're balanced. Uh, see, that's yeah, that's kind of where I was going in, into that next one is you could probably connect the two there is. Other than race, you know, what role does money play within the police force itself? And like you said, as you can start to see those political moves at the end of elected officials. Yeah, I mean, they're every, so each agency is different in where they draw the line. But you only have three ranks in the Baltimore Police Department before you hit political appointments. So the entire command staff is politically appointed. It used to not be that way. It used to be. Uh, earned rank up to captains who ran a district. Now, anything above the shift is a political appointment. So they're all under direct control playing a political game, and that political game fucks over the officers and the citizens. Yeah. Um, yeah my mom, actually, my mother, shout out to you, Mama Levy. She's been in county government for a long, long time and has worked her way up to the top of it. And I have talked to her many times about a lot of those political moves of of either it's for the money or it's for the look or they make these decisions and i uh i mean i i see it similar way it seems like the localized governments those good old boy systems are just holding on for dear life yeah i mean but that so that's what got them the power right so it's we have this kind of what policing allows us to do is that the power and the microscope makes you see like society it's just a microcosm of, of our entire society so all these things that you see reflected within us as a whole are just brought out to the light in policing um, so think of whatever issue you're you're kind of thinking about and you'll see it come to fruition in policing it, no matter what it is on that political spectrum so when you see the politics doing those things in, in, in bigger politics. They're also doing it on that micro level within because it's, it, you're, you're trying to, they got there that way, right? So what we're doing in a society right now is we're fighting anti-intellectualism from a like Generation X and younger perspective. So mm -hmm. we're, we're fighting this big battle of people who want the status quo versus a large movement of progressiveness. And what we're doing there is we're also, it's a hard fight because you're telling all those people that everything they've done to get to where they are is wrong. So you're not just telling your parents that you're not a conservative, you're a progressive. You're also telling them that their religion is bullshit, which they believed in in their whole life, that the way that they got playing the game and, and following the rules and being loyal to a company, that all those things are over and they, the, all their lessons don't apply to us anymore. So they get offended by that and dig in deeper. And you, that's, you see it just, it's, it's, it's everywhere. Yeah. So I'm now I'm going to ask something a little tough here is, I mean, all right, I'm going to play a different third person. All right. So everybody that may start commenting here, this is just, uh, just for the question. Uh, I mean, but come on, Michael, we, we know the truth, right? These, these are ghettos, right? These, these, uh, these places are filled with drug dealers and prostitution and they're, they're murderers and they don't care. So we have to go in there with force. We, we have to shut that down. I mean, uh, let's face it, right? You announcing all these things are just revealing, you know, uh, just what we have to do because of that type of area. Yeah, that's what the area is. Totally correct. And we've shaped it that way on purpose as a society. Um, but what we have learned in this entire process is that each time we use a hammer, we're just making more nails sprout up. So we know that what we're doing doesn't work. And what we do know is that crime reduction is correlated to things such as lead poisoning abatement, opportunities, identity projects, uh, broken windows as a, an environmental perspective, not as a means of policing and transportation systems, resources such as food, good schools. These are the things that lower crime rate. It is not being a hammer. We, we, when we go in and we take a father off the street, 
we are literally making that situation worse because having that father in that home would be a better environment. So you took him out of the home for a dime bag. Now he goes into jail, can't get a job. So each time you do that, you just exacerbate the problem. We, I think we, have, we are now at the point where we have the lowest crime rate in American history or really in world history. And that's been despite policing, not because of policing. Oh, that's a huge comparison. Despite policing instead of the policing. I mean, but come on, right? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, right? I mean, that's and that we're going to tell them. Their communities should police themselves. And if anybody cared, you're in America and just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I'm comfortable with that as well. The problem is, is they don't have bootstraps. So <laughs> let's give them bootstraps. Uh, you, you, they don't come out of magic land. Um, so if instead of telling me that they need bootstraps, well, help me get them bootstraps. Man, I love that because I think that's such an irrational notion, notion to say that. And, you know, unless you've been there and, you know, I think we're all probably been involved with it somewhere or another, right? That we get that the idea of tickets and quotas and arrests and jail probation, you know, that this is a way of collecting money and pulling taxes on us, if you will. But can you explain like how this perpetuates the family cycle? You started to touch on it now, uh, but how it perpetuates certain cycles within these really heavily policed communities. Well, you end up with a debtor's prison for even the good people. So if you're in a poor community, I mean, that, what do we do? We act like $12,000 a year in, in welfare is some kind of way to sustain a life. You know, even if it was that people that like to say that, it's like, well, why aren't you doing that? then? if it's so great, I, I'm baffled by why you're talking to me about it instead of enjoying that wonderful lifestyle. So if they don't have enough money, what we do is we say things like a $50 parking fine, right? But a $50 parking fine is a whole different world to me than it is to that guy that makes $12,000 a year. That's how it becomes a request a regressive tax and you feed off the poor because that is the money that he needs to get his rent. So when he can't get his rent, he then goes and gets to the payday loans, which saturate these types of environments. And then you get a high interest loan and then you go back and you have to, then you pay your bill. But now that's not a $50 ticket. It ended up being an $82 ticket because you had to get that loan out of the bank. And then they're driving their car and they don't have that $82. So they can't get the tires that they needed. So now they got a repair order and the police tow their car. And now the, that their car is towed, now they can't get to work. So now they got to ride the bus. Well, the bus is late, so they get fired. And now they're back home and you need to make money. And how do you make money? Well, the only way that you can make money on the corner in the hood where there's absolutely no resources to maybe go sling some, some crack on the corner. You go sling the crack on the corner. You get locked up and now you have a record. And now you can't get a job even if you had a car and you had a bus that was reliable. So these things just keep going on and on. There's a thousand ways that this occurs. And when it's because there's just so many barriers up that what we like to do is we like to find the one guy that can run the hurdles and an Olympic pace and go, oh, my God, why can't everybody be him? It's like, well, he had luck and he, he was fucking outstanding. You know, we can't hold people up to be everyone's not going to be Bill Gates or something like you can't expect that to be so. So what we need to do is start taking those hurdles down instead of thinking about how everyone should jump faster. Now, that's a cognitive rampage. I would. Yes. I mean, like you said, we have to give them the bootstraps. I mean, and you get in that cycle. I, I remember being poor when when I was kicked out of college after my injury. It was really fast how they drop you, too. Right. You're no you're no longer useful, useful to us. Pay for your education. And I remember getting a ticket or sending a wreck. And I'm going, shit. I can't now pay for my ticket. They suspended my license. If I don't drive to work, I, I lose my job. I mean, it seems to be like, I don't want to say conspiracy, but I mean, maybe it's just worked out that way. But it does. They, they feed off the poor. They throw them in jail, lock them up. I mean, people in Florida now, when you get out of jail, you have a bill. I mean, you get billed for the days that you're in jail down here. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 just fundamentally illogical that it's, it's like getting a fine for a late fee. It's like, well, I, mean, <laughs> right. I don't understand. Like if I had the money, I wouldn't be late. So it, you're just fighting somebody that doesn't have any money. And then you put them into that, that servitude. So even if you are just somebody that runs a private prison and you have the greatest of intentions, if there's a vote for more people to go in jail, like you're just implicitly going to follow those kind of incentives. And so everything to me is incentives and disincentives. I don't really 
apply my policing principles. I, I know I speak to you with emotion, but I don't apply my policing principles with emotion. They're strictly for, from the literature and from applying these things in a rational aspect. Mm. I'm, you know, we're speaking of the, the, this idea of consequences or punishment, you know, and in psychology, I talk a lot about parenting on how you don't use the word punishment, that they have to understand there's consequences. Punishment assumes devalue of the person. And so, you know, there's, a, there's probably two parts to the question is, you know, we spoke earlier to the social norms that influence, um, you know, the police forces, the brass, the promotions, et cetera. Um, where do you see those so social norms or social constructs? Uh, playing into the ju the uh, judicial process with the prosecution, with penalty matching, et cetera. And this is another thing that's in everything, though, dude. It's in everything. So you see those factors playing out, whether it's so. So the the theory that I have, it's not even like my theory. Remember, none of these are mine. Is is that you just have factors? So you have black, you have brown, you have Muslim, you have female, you have all the LGBTs, you, you have all these things of discrimination uh, and poor. So people like to say, oh, it's just a class issue. Well, you're right. There's a class as a factor in that. So if you're white and poor, you have that poor factor and the system has all these things that are going to hurt you in a percentage, you know, so you might be at 5% being hurt. But if you are a female and you're white and you're poor, well, then you have even more percentage of, of things being done disproportionately to you. And then by the time you're like a female black Muslim, like you're just screwed. So so that's the way it comes out. And I mean, I, I know that it sounds weird to say that it's in everything, but it's in what kind of lawyer you have. It's in how the judge hands down sentences. It's in which jails you actually get transported to. It like comes down to which wing you're in. It comes down to how long you're on probation or, or how much empathy there is for you whatsoever. I mean, that white rapist, I mean, we all like saw that dramatic disparity where the judge is like, oh, the jail will hurt him. Well, everybody thinks the jail is going to help the 24-year-old black kid because he needs that punishment. And that's what I was trying to challenge Joe on when we said this in his podcast, uh, Rogan's, is that, he said, "Like these people need to be punished." I was like, really? Like that's that even isn't even the inception of the system. It's supposed to be rehabilitation. So at all these things that we do, we have that religion and that ideology of punishment because that's a religious thing too. That punishment will lead us somewhere. We know it doesn't lead us somewhere. It doesn't lead us anywhere with our children. It doesn't lead us anywhere. You know, the death penalty. We know it is not a deterrent. So we have to like just use our brains and think about what we're doing because it is in every single aspect. Man, you're right. I mean, I'm glad you challenged Joe on that point of the punishment, but that just speaks to, you know, how quickly we can take a concrete belief that's been enforced through constructs and how we've lived our lives and then force those onto a society and not even realize, you know, that outcome. And, you know, it, I mean, it goes directly to the idea of right drugs, right, of the idea of using drugs and forcing this idea of punishment onto somebody that's using drugs or addicted to drugs. Well, any consensual adult agreement, I'm going to go with that, that route on. Um, prostitution clearly falls under this line. For some reason, prostitution is legal if you put a ring on it. But other than that, it's not. And, and like maybe the other uh, ideology that you could say is, is that I think you don't actually pay a prostitute for sex, right? You pay them to not talk about it afterwards. So, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. you're not even actually paying them for the sex. That doesn't make any sense as, as a concept. So just like with drugs, anything where two people are agreeing to this, because even with prostitution, you are taking away that woman's right to her body. I say that like about my daughter. Like if even if you're a feminist, like I don't get to tell my daughter who she dates or or I don't get to tell her she can't sleep with somebody or be here. Like that's her body. That's not my say. And as a culture, we want to talk about liberty, but you tell every single woman what they can and can't do with their body. That's preposterous. So we have all these, that's what I'm saying. There's all these things in our society that are telling us to behave this way that goes against what rational logic. 
Man, I, that's going to hit a home for a lot of people, including me being a dad of a 16 year old, you know, and that's true. And it, the fact that a feminist wouldn't support prostitution, you know, would kind of go against what they say. I mean, it's it's the oldest uh, trade. I mean, I'm not going to spend too much time on that idea. But, you know, I mean, I'm with you, though, is that we we enforce these social constructs of beliefs into laws, but they're beginning now to affect the family structure, the lives of children and grandchildren as we continue to enforce these standards. Yeah, and, and that's where I think that ultimately we'll be fine because that are the people, I mean, I, I'm drawing an arbitrary line, but we're going with like 40 and below. As a whole, we're getting this. Uh, people are talking. We're breaking down some barriers. Like the if, if anyone wants to challenge this, go to a Black Lives Matter protest. The, literally, go to it and walk in the middle of it. You're not going to see, if you are afraid to go, what you're going to see is the exact opposite of what you think you're going to see. You're going to see every age group, every race, every religion, every type of gender norm, every type of education level. There will be professors standing next to 16-year-olds still in high school, and it will be a good atmosphere for you. You'll see that it's not anything that you think. Uh, so it, it's just that we have to break ourselves out of that, and that's what we are doing. So once we get some power, I think that people of our age are like on that leading edge of that. So what I think is that the millennials, once they get power and they need people with experience, then they'll finally lean on us to be the ones that they entrust with that power. And then we can start doing smart things. The problem is, is that that delay, which might be I don't know, 10 to 20 years in that process, all these lives and all these neighborhoods continue to be destroyed in that process. So what we're really trying to do is just speed this thing up. Yeah. And, you know, I, I'm not going to rub your back too much, but I do commend you for stepping against the grain and, and saying these things. I, I did something similar with drug treatment therapy when I was on Rogan, uh, denouncing how it's actually killing people and you coming out saying this. What, what we are really saying here is this is killing people and destroying lives of those that aren't even born yet. And like you, I have a gigantic faith in the millennials, uh, which a lot of older adults do not, baby boomers do not, but I, I do. I know my daughter's smarter than me, and I watch how they love and accept, but they pay attention to the research almost of what's fact more than the social norm. Well, I mean, it's actually a documented fallacy now. It goes back to the, the latest written records we have. Every generation has thought that the next generation was going to be shit. And every single time, the next generation outproduced the previous generation. So every time you are blaming the next generation, you're a fool. Because that generation is guaranteed to be better than your generation. And it's just like they make fun of them for having the cell phone in their hand. And it's like, are you serious? The greatest invention ever. So that cell phone is the portal to the world's knowledge and you laugh at them for holding it really yeah i think, well, I think it judges them right i mean it like I, I talk a lot about on the podcast i'll keep it short it's about you know when something or someone goes against what we believe it automatically devalues us and then we choose to respond either defensively or offensively and so when people haven't been to a black lives matter or they haven't had a friend affected by those injustices that they seem to go wait a minute i've never thought about this or felt this way it hasn't happened to me you're devaluing what i believe and they fight against that like uh, i did early as a father right is going hey watch the phone in the minutes and then i'm like oh don't be on twitter so much right and then you kind of back up and go stop I'm, I'm just enforcing my own concrete beliefs about what should be and i mean are we almost inhibiting you know the younger generation from being able to blossom to who they really are by forcing those same beliefs on them i i mean i think that's that's panned out to be true throughout history i mean i i i, I get on baby boomers and like i take a lot of heat for it but I'm sorry, as a generation, you are fucking us like there is no tomorrow. You fuckers went to college for free and you put me $100,000 in debt to do it and I had to go train to kill people for as a 17-year-old for shit you got for free? Get the fuck out of here. Man. Well, I mean, god damn, Mike. I, 
you're right. I mean, we talk about as parents, right, is to to leave a better life for our kids because we want better for them. But you'll see parents go, no, the college shouldn't be free, right? They should have debt like I do or work like I do. It's almost as if they really don't want to make the next generation better than them. Yeah, they want to be the ones like, look how I did it. And you guys couldn't do it. You know, it's like, I'm like, I got a, one of the reasons I have a PhD is because I look at my daughter and I say, guess what? You got to at least have a PhD because you got to exceed me, right? Like that's your responsibility as a child. So I'm setting a high bar so that you have to achieve an even higher bar. And it's my 100% responsibility to make sure that she has those stairs in front of her every time she goes to take a step up. And that's what we need to think of as a whole society. That's really what my policing model is about, that if you put the poor, if you're trying to lift the poorest and you're making sure those steps are in place for the poorest, well, then the steps are in place for everybody. And it's like, so you just think about that from a small level. On a small level, we can do that. We can think about that with our friends and family. We can think about that in terms of our neighborhood. But for some reason, maybe that 150 to 200 people tribal ape thing that, that still lingers in us that doesn't want to associate beyond that. But just broaden your circle to realize that if you treat everybody like you would treat that small circle around you, then that's, if you treat that small circle around you well, you know that that circle is better for it. Well, that's the exact same case just by spreading that circle out. Mm, man, and what we're talking about is really telling people, I think, to to challenge your own beliefs, right? Challenge those things that you think to be concrete, you know, in reality. And this, these last couple parts, man, we're probably going to touch a little bit on those people's concrete beliefs and and some of mine, man. But uh, you know, rather than sit with you and debate the writing of the Second Amendment, okay, I'm not going to sit with you and debate what they wrote back before they had the wheel, pretty much. Right. And, and what they were doing, I understand they had the wheel, but you know what I mean? And rather than debate that idea with you, um, I liked your notion of we should be treating owning a firearm as a privilege and not a right. Well, I mean, to, to even say anything about the Second Amendment, let's be clear, like I don't have a position on the Second Amendment. Um, and what Joe and I were talking about was just discussing like, what does this say? I well, don't that's know what I'm what yeah, I don't know what the goddamn said, thing says. That's the problem. The problem is, is that I don't know what it says. You can come at it from a different angle and have a completely rational argument that it says something else, and then about six more people can come in and to explain it rationally that it means something else. That's the damn problem. So even if you say, what is the right of this, that we're treating it like a right, like, I don't know. I mean, is it a right? Like, we have to, like, even reconsider whether... It is like as a society, like not even whether they meant it as a right. Who gives a shit what they meant? The big genius that they had was amendments that meant they know they didn't know the future. And so they put amendments in there knowing that they were humans that were capable of flaws like they were when they had slavery and that women couldn't vote. Then those things are also amendments. I'm talking about amending an amendment. You can't be upset about amending an amendment, you know, because it's an amendment to begin with. So the, the Second Amendment thing isn't just, it's just not, like, I just don't care about it. It's, the problem is, is we need to rediscuss it. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, I guess kind of what I meant, I mean, maybe reorganize it. What I kind of meant is I understand the semantics behind it and how basically the subjectivity could play in. So I didn't want to walk down the subjective notion of it, but I kind of like the idea, though, that we treat, you know, driving as a privilege. They're quick to tell you that, right? When the cop pulls you over and takes your license on your way to work to feed your kids, they're quick to tell you that it's a privilege, right? Even though more people are killed with automobiles, right? I mean, that's a weapon you're allowed to yield, period, right? So I, I don't know either. I'm with you. I, I, I don't have a starch view on the idea. Um, we could play it back and forth. But I did want to bring up that idea of possibly, you know, questioning that idea. Is it a right for everybody? Is it easier to just give everybody the right to a gun until we find mental illness or until they shoot up everybody? You know, is it better to go, no, you don't get your car. You don't get your weapon right away. You know, we, we you know. This is something you almost got to earn, prove, you know, almost that you're healthy enough to yield this. Yeah, I, I don't, I'm not 100% positive that it matters whether it's a mm. privilege or a right. Mm. Because just like any right, you have to, they all have qualifiers on them. Uh, I mean, even the First Amendment, freedom of speech has qualifiers on it. Sure. So everything has a qualifier. So even if it's, if you want to say it's your right to own a weapon, well, we can still say, okay, but you have to achieve step one, two, three, and four, and then 
you're right. You have that right, but you have to achieve, be able to achieve steps, you know, one, two, three, and four. So I don't care what that is because we all agree on gun control unless someone's idiotic enough to think that we should all be able to have nukes and RPGs and, and, you know, hellfire missiles on F-16s. If you really think we should have that stuff, then you're an idiot and I can't have a conversation with you. But but so we all agree on gun control. It's just a matter of where that line is being drawn. And I have suggestions to where that line is being drawn. But what I'm trying to say is that we need to clearly define what that line is instead of arguing about who 200 years ago, where they thought the line may be in 2016. Now, we need to decide where the line is in 2016 because the idea of tyranny, I think, is fucking silly. You're not taking over the U.S. government that has the nukes and has the hellfire missiles and has, they don't even have to show up. They have drones, dude. They don't even need to show up to your M16 party. It doesn't matter. So <laughs> that's not rational. So it, it become it really where it's rational is this home defense and hunting. That's rational. And that creates a different line. Mm, man, you, you're right. What, what is the Mac 11 going to do, man, when the drone is, is laser sighting from 100 miles away an RPG or something? There's, yeah. I mean, think about the Iraq war. So the Iraqs in the first in Desert Storm, Saddam Hussein's army was like, well, it's like the fifth best in the, in the world, right? And we were there with our tanks killing their tanks. They didn't even know where we were. They didn't know there was another tank there because our tanks can be so far away that they don't even know where it's coming from. So, like, you're going to beat this with a bunch of rednecks and M16s? Get the fuck out of here. This is ridiculous. And then on top of that, you're saying that I would come and shoot you when I was a Marine? No, we're not going to do that. So the ones you have the fear are the ones with the drones and have all that, that stuff, and you're not beating them. Man, I'm that's direct. I can't help, man. The, I'm I'm gonna jump off the guns, man, because I I want to get into um you know your your policies that you like or that you would have suggested about uh, reforming policing and giving it back to the community, uh you know, etc. And I, I've heard you reference uh, a few things, but I'd probably start with there about. Can you elaborate on what you mean by either the reform in policing or giving the department back to the community? Well, those are synonymous uh, for, from my perspective, is that um, I, I thought long and hard about how you would structure this managerially in a way that's sustainable. So think about how policing is at this moment. Its job is on the surface to control crime, right? So if it were actually successful, it would defeat its purpose for existence. So it's an illogical structure and it would never, it doesn't have a goal to succeed because it would create its own death. So you have to create something that's going to go for it in perpetuity to be better for the community. And the only way to do that is to actually have the community in charge so that for the first time you're saying the police are supposed to serve the community, but they've never asked the community what the community wants them to do. They've always told the community what they're going to do to lower crime, and that doesn't work. Just like how a managerial, if you go and you find the best managerial expert to come evaluate your factory, he is going to go down and he's gonna to talk to your lowest paid employee that's working on the line because that guy knows everything that's wrong because he's living it, he's doing it. So we have to have the people that are living and doing and being subjected to policing to dictate where policing goes for forever. So what I want to sell them is I want to sell you that we have a department that is really hard on investigations and is structured to do go after people in crimes and find justice and is incentivized and provides resources for detectives to go do that ground level work. But essential to that is a patrol agency that serves the community like in a true service form where the incentives and the metrics are that an officer needs to know everybody in that neighborhood. He needs to, when he finds somebody, even if we're going to say that we have dime bags of, of weed are still illegal. Oh, I lost my light. Hold on. I'm still here. There we go. So even if we're going to say dime bags and stuff of weed are still illegal, when the cop gets that kid, he needs to figure out why that kid has the dime bag. 
why he's out on that corner, and then go attack those problems. When it's crimes of violence, then it's the, still the same case. We fundamentally need our detectives to get people a, and find justice, but the goal should be to recognize that every time we make an arrest, we are completely failing our mission. And because of that, we need to figure out where we failed our mission. So the goal of any arrest should be to figure out how that person got to that situation to commit that crime of violence, because we need to attack the causes. What we are attacking is the symptoms. That person's crime is a symptom. And so we, if we, the public will easily say, yes, we need to fight. I, I got no confidence uh, problem with that. If we have seven people, they're all going to want me to figure out why this happened, not to just throw that kid in jail who is their cousin's, uh, their neighbor's cousin, you know. So these things can continue to fulfill themselves by finding out why we have problems. So cops are figuring out why we have problems. Crime is just an element of those problems. So we have to fundamentally restructure what policing is from that ground level cop. Because when that ground level cop acts that way, the information that he has for those detectives is astronomical. That's why, a part of the reason why crime rates used to be higher when you had that more officer friendly approach because you had detectives that could lean on patrol officers to gather street intel now they can't do those things so we're we're like we're destroying the whole system because we're worried about being like the bully and the gang on the block instead of being service like that's what i mean when you you have community policing can't be just like some guys assigned the foot patrol to walk around. It literally has to be your job is to meet all these neighbors. Your job is to know these kids and you need to be here. You need to integrate, not occupy. That's really the policing ideology. Oh, I love that to integrate, not occupy, man. I mean, you are using so many tools from psychology here uh, on how you're connecting this together. How now, how exactly would you go about giving this community back to the, or giving the department back to the community? How do they get to make those choices? Right, so that's the biggest question, um, is first, who gets to be those seven or so people who are on the police board? So that, that's a problem. I, I don't know that answer. I think each community uh, needs to, we need to hash that out with each group. Uh, my ideal vision, is that we have about seven members and we have an algorithm that specifies that four of those seven members will come from districts that are uh, the poorest of the communities so that they have the majority influence in the agency. And that again creates that system so that everything that's good for the poorest among us is good for the richest among us. And that creates that uplifting boat from a foundation that, that, that will transcend down throughout the entire agency as you go on. Now, those seven people, the way I view it is, is, say I'm like a CEO manager and they're like the board and they control the company. They have 51% of the power. I have 49% of the power and it's my job to do tiebreakers and it's my job to convince them of different things. But if they decide they want to, you know, if I, I don't want to enforce drug laws, right? But if they decide that they do, well, then so be it. That's what, that's what I do. I'm responsible. I, I would be directly accountable to them. And then I would have a civilian wing and a sworn wing that are completely separated under my command. The policing would be entirely separated from all administration so that every time a police had to write a report, it would have to go through a professional civilian HR, not some cop that's been assigned to be in charge of HR, where they can have the administrative deals done properly and separate it from the agency. Because one of the, I, the primary responsibilities is to get the least amount of state guns on the street. So like I want being a sworn officer to be a uh, special thing. Yeah, you know, wow, man, this is these are good ideas. You know, I can see eventually, though, the local county elected chairs from counties money getting involved in politics as usual once it comes to these elected spots. But uh, I love, though, how you're using the stigma, right? You understand that the a stigma exists that, hey, we just enforce the laws. We don't make them. And you use that stigma to say, OK, now we can continue to enforce the laws because now the laws are actually coming from the community. And that, that seems very genius and practical and maybe a way if it's really service on this board, I love the board idea too, is what if we just, what if it's a lottery of rotation that we actually have to do our service and go sit on this police board for the month? Yeah, now sure. Now the problem is, is 
maybe we use like the city council or something as the first year's board and we have to vote. Is that what we're going to do? Because like, I think that what a way to do it is that the board changes every year. And, and so you would have one member that would be elected to stay as like the chairperson of the board. So they would understand the administrative processes and stuff that go on. And then sure, like I think a lottery for those other slots is perfectly logical. Um, we just have to have an algorithm at the beginning that's untouchable so that no one can corrupt the system later on for those balances. Um, when it comes to finances, the way I see it is that like the mayor will still need a security detail. So we have to provide that. Um, and then you're going to have events and things like that, that the civilians can't necessarily, the panel can't say, hey, we're not providing security for the Democratic National Convention because we disagree with them. So the, the city council will have things that they'll, they'll have to approve all the events that we'll be responsible for covering. But the thing is, is you have a central figure like me that's directly accountable and transparent for all of those things to be conducted. So if they tell me that they, whatever idea they have, we have to develop milestones and goals and I'm directly accountable for achieving to them. Otherwise, then they're gonna find themselves another CEO. It must be a civilian. I think the civilian, the CEO also must be a civilian. The only sworn members come on that under police side wing. I love this, man. It takes an idea of humility. And you used this years ago, I noticed, when you said, stop calling me by my rank and salute me. Call me Michael. So this is that same humility approach of going, listen, I'm, I'm a CEO here. I'm not the guy in charge. I'm not the sheriff guy. This is the community. This is the board. You know, over time, Michael, I can see the younger generation going, wait a minute, we can decide whether the local police enforcement lets us see a rated R movie at 16, right, or something, you know, anything, but they could get more involved with the idea that, because right now people just, that cognitive dissonance is so tight that it's like, well, we can't change anything. The system's just screwed up, accept it for what it is, you know, and all these arguments are popping up with rare, rarely do you find a solution. And something like this is, it's a definite start, if not, needs to be implemented and tested almost immediately. Well, I mean, think about it. Isn't this really, this, this fits the libertarian agenda. This fits the conservative agenda. I'm talking about spending money more wisely, and I'm talking about local control. Isn't that what all conservatives talk about is local control? So I'm talking about you, not the Fed. If the federal government says comes down and says they want to do some crazy law like the drug war, then you can say, no, we're not enforcing it. So, I mean, that this is this ties in with all of us. That, that's why it's a it's a boat that will uplift all of us. We just have to understand that everything that doesn't directly benefit us will do it eventually. Wow, man, that was strong. You skip right over something like that. I, I love it. If you want to keep federally marijuana illegal, but you want to enforce it, fine, Fed, you send it in. But could you imagine how the community would feel that say was pro marijuana? could turn around and knew that their local police officers were on their team to battle such a stupid law federally. Right. I mean, that's what I'm talking about. It's, it's like, it's, it's, uh, we say that it's service, but it's not. I'm just saying, yes, we value, we, we do protect life and we do serve. That's, that's all I'm saying. That's what it's, this is not new ideas. I'm just saying that we actually try to serve and protect. That's all I'm saying. You guys have been telling me this is what we're doing. And all as I've said is this is not what we're doing. Let's do that thing you think we're doing. Man, God, the common sense eludes. You know, you've referenced the John Hopkins study by uh, your friend Stephanie Dulac. Uh, du was it DeLuca? DeLuca, De yeah. And, um, you know, you have been talking about something I, I, I wanted to get further with you about, about an identity project and the effect on youth and the community. And, you know, elaborate on the idea of the identity project as kind of a attachment and how you may implement this. And lastly, is there a specific story that may hit you that hit home about the power of an identity project? So um, I think Stephanie would come and talk to you about this day in and day out and even give you more nuance as to what this is. She, she's definitely a good, a good to talk to. Hey, I'd love to have her on, man. If uh, yeah, yeah, I, looked set into, that up. I looked into her study for sure, but go ahead. Sorry. And so an identity project is just what we, I think we don't, as a society understand that the world we see is not the world that other people see. So when we see, hey, you can become a photographer, 
there are people in East Side Baltimore that don't know anyone that's ever been a photographer. They don't know any photographers. They don't know that you can make money in photography. They don't know that these things are even realistic endeavors. So identity projects can come in a variety of fashions. One can be like, if you have that white privilege and you have a skill in the county, you can come in and teach people how to do those things and be a resource for them to give them that identity project. So for instance, if you were good at photography, you could come and teach people and you can do that. This is what Devin Allen does. So that would be my uh, like shining example, which I'm completely biased about because he's my friend. So <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> but he was a drug dealer and ended up picking up the camera and started falling in love with the camera thinking, you know, I'm just going to do this. And he, it, things went and he ended up taking that shot that was on the cover of Time Magazine. That's the photo of the year that uh, has the uh, police chasing uh, the people from the uprising. And it looks like it, like the Time Magazine cover says, it looks like it's 1968, doesn't look like it's 2015. And uh, the wonderful story about that is I was, I actually saw the Time Magazine cover and I had it on my phone and I looked at my mom and uh, she was next to me. I showed it to her. I said, look at this. That's crazy. And she was like, God, it was wild back then, wasn't it? I said, no, it's really not. That's fucking yesterday. Oh, shit. And, and so it really highlighted the effectiveness of Devin's picture. And since then, what Devin has done is he's started a phone. Uh, he had celebrity from that. So he started collecting cameras and he's getting people to donate cameras to him. So now his fundamental goal in life is he goes around in all the neighborhoods that are impoverished that he still hangs out in all day long and takes pictures and takes kids around, giving them their own cameras and teaching them how to do photography. And he de dedicates his life to this and he provides an identity project for all these kids. He's, this, this dude is going to end up touching hundreds and thousands of lives, if not thousands of lives, and he's just one person. So if other people did this, it would be astronomical because they, what they think is they, they just think these kids don't want to achieve. They desperately want to achieve. And that's what the Lucas study highlighted is that they fight super hard to achieve. They're fighting, like I said, every generation is better. And these kids are, the millennials are, are ex exceeding all measures of expectations on how much they would succeed. They've done 300 to 400% the success of the previous generation of their parents. And so we disparage them. And these guys are fighting hard. All they need is the end. Man. Okay. Uh, Mike, if, if, can I call you Mike? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> if I can help in any community that you're involved with, I, I speak sometimes a lot to the local schools here, man. But, you know, I, I think I have a, a little talent for podcasting and teaching people how to do this. And if I can help in any place that you're involved with, that I can come and teach some kids, you know, it doesn't take much, you know, to, to know how to do this. And I, dude, I'm inspired. I, I think, yeah, if I can help, man, please let me know. I'll be there in a heartbeat. I'll teach everything I know about this, man. I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I probably shouldn't say this, but I, I back then was a drug dealer myself. I, that's where I turned when sports went away from me and injury was done and I had no financial support whatsoever. It's, it felt like I had no choice. You know, I had, once football was gone, I talk about this a lot. I lost my identity when, when it wasn't a football player. I had no identity and without any project, my God, I, I went into fighting and I had to go into drug dealing just to feel that same rush that I got on Friday and Saturdays when I strapped up, you know? Yeah, totally. I mean, I get that. I went from playing ball to going to the Marine Corps. So, I mean, I did the exact same uh, transition the same way and you get that identity as a Marine. So I like actively fought that identity as a Marine though. And in the police department, they do that same thing. And while I continue to try and fight that because I am a child of rage, that I, I, you know, I, I start to, I tried to see the system for what it was and, and tried to fight it, but I was corrupted along the line and eventually got back to my true self. Man, a child of rage, brother. You said that and it was powerful, man. That kind of hit me in the heart a little bit when you said that. Well, I mean, I can't remember anyone's words influencing me more than Zach Gilaroka's when I was a kid. So, like, I feel like I'm finally back to that, you know, and, and that's why like, I, it's a side note, but like, we're all screaming for De La Roca to come back right now because it's like, it's all time. We didn't, we didn't get anywhere. We like, everyone rested on our laurels and, and society went through this pause where we all just got too happy and too complacent in what we had achieved and we stopped progressing. 
and now we have this new wave coming and and we need our some of our old heroes back man that's that's a good place to end man that's a heck of a cognitive rampage michael I, I don't I, I don't know what to say brother it's just it's not like it's just things they're not rocket science man and it's 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 just us as a community as a people coming together to do things to to make it better for all of us like i don't want you to fucking have to go to the mall to be afraid of somebody with a gun i don't want i don't want the spouses of cops to worry about whether they're going to come home or not i don't want drug cops i don't want swat teams raiding drug houses and throwing flashbangs in baby cribs like this this is like we all want this it's just we have to shed those, I don't know, that weight we've carried on us that as a society that makes us think we have to be tougher and we have to be more masculine. And we don't. We have to be more vulnerable and we have to be more humble and, and let power go down instead of up. Man, we're cutting it right there, Michael. You can't say it any better, man. Thank you for coming on the show, man. Thank you for expressing yourself and your stories and your history, man, and, and your visions. And I'm here, man. You you got the tribe of change and the, and all us warriors out here trying to make changes on your side. And uh, if we can help you or have you on the show, whatever, or come to wherever you're at in any any community and help, man, you, you, you got your back, man. Thanks, brother, man. Be safe. Appreciate you. Thank you, brother.